All right, hello all and uh, welcome to this Sunday edition of Introverse Uncharted. Uh, as promised in my coming soon video, it's uh, Sunday, May 7th, and it's the day after WWE Backlash 2023. Um, I have some thoughts. We'll run through the, uh, the entire match card. I'm going to give some star rankings to uh, every match, talk about <clears throat> how excuse me how each match went and uh just kind of my opinion on uh, on all of it um before we do that though kind of as always uh this is an amateur podcast so you're gonna hear some outside noise you're gonna hear my kid and all that stuff especially on a sunday house is a little bit busier uh i apologize in advance is kind of what it is um if you haven't yet run on over to tiktok run on over to instagram run on over to facebook uh, at TikTok, I'm at introverse underscore uncharted. Instagram, at introverse underscore uncharted 13. Facebook, I'm just at introverse uncharted. But go check out all those. Uh, TikTok, I was doing essentially a play by play. I was actually live streaming, uh, not like on the internet or whatever, but through Messenger with a, with a buddy who's a big wrestling fan like me. And uh, so as that was going on, I was TikToking kind of live with, with brief thoughts on each match kind of as the night went on. But uh, go over there and check that out. I have a lot of content over there right now. Uh, this is obviously where the big show happens, right? Where uh, where the main Introverse Uncharted show happens. But if you want to see some smaller thoughts and uh, just goofy activity that I like to do over on TikTok, go check that out. It's probably where I uh, utilize my most of my time or whatever when I'm not doing the main show. Um Happy Sunday, everybody. I really didn't say that out the gate, you know? Uh, happy Sunday. I normally don't uh, broadcast to you guys on Sundays, but happy Sunday. Uh, glad you guys made it through the week. Hope you guys have had an awesome weekend. Uh, here in Denver, the weather has been absolutely beautiful this weekend. Um, you know, starting today off with a podcast, going to finish it off with, uh, with some cold beverages and some friends, most likely. So, uh, hope you guys are also having an incredible weekend, uh. With that being said, let's dig into the content, you know? All right, so we kicked off the show with uh, Io Sky versus Bianca Belair for the Raw Women's title. Um, I thought this was an absolutely amazing match uh, to start off the evening. Um, I think arguably you could say that this is uh, EO Sky's breakout opportunity. Um, we've already seen plenty of what uh, of what Bianca can do in the ring and, and with the belt. I think she's held the belt for, what, 400 days, something like that now. Um, but to see somebody who kind of, I mean, gets called up and then falls into a faction and kind of sits at the wayside, because we all know when we think damage control, we automatically think Bailey. Whether or not you guys want to kind of admit that or not, uh, we're not really thinking about the the other two. We're thinking about Bailey. Uh, Bailey runs that group, and with all the turmoil, I I know when when Vince got back in charge, there was plenty of people who thought Bailey was going to be out the door, which that obviously has not happened. But uh, I think this is EO's big moment, and uh, and she crushed it. She stepped up to the plate and she hit it out of the park and. Bianca also did an absolutely amazing job. So I think that this is arguably the launch pad for EO. And I think now we start to, I think it was already kind of in conversation, right? But I think now we start talking, is this the beginning of the end of damage control? Uh, obviously, if you watch the match, uh, Bailey plays a, a very large part in the end of this match. And arguably, another commentator said it too, uh, had Bailey not been there, you could probably argue that EO can pull off this match and win this match. Um, so I think the turmoil just kicks up now, right? I think now, now you start to look towards what could possibly be the end of damage control, which to me is fine. I was never a huge fan of the damage control faction. I've never been uh, huge on the Bailey bus None of that kind of stuff. Uh, ding dong, nobody cares. So, yeah, I I think this is the the start of, a, of an avalanche for that. And I look forward to that because now we get to see what, you know, EO can do. Uh, and I think you could argue that she's a, a future women's champion. And, and hopefully, hopefully the company utilizes this as a solid push. But um, out of... I'm going to start, I said in the intro, I'm going to 
rank some matches here, out of, give them some star value. So I'm going to go uh, four out of five stars for this match. Uh, I think this match was an excellent way to kick off the event. And I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but let's just briefly, the crowd, the, I mean, the whole show was, was absolutely on fire, minus the last segment or two, which I'll, I'll talk about as we get to those. But uh, the crowd was absolutely popping. They were loving this match. They were getting into it, getting their uh, their count on. It was amazing. So uh, this match was an excellent way to kick off. I was hesitant when I saw that that was going to be the kickoff match, but uh, awesome match altogether. I, I really enjoyed it. I think they lit it up. They started an excellent fire, got that crowd into it, uh, set up for some pretty good matches uh, down the road. Um. And then you get to match number two, <laughs> excuse me, which is uh, Seth freaking Rollins versus Omos. Uh, I haven't done one of uh, one of these before, one of these reviews, and I really haven't talked a ton of wrestling on the show. So let me just take this moment to say that Vince obviously has this thing about seven feet tall, four hundred pound, monstrous. <laughs> men that he thinks are like once in a lifetime specimens and this goes all the way back this goes andre the giant it goes the giant gonzalez who was an absolute bust it goes big show it goes kali who arguably was a bust up until he went into like the punjabi playboy phase of his career and the fans started to kind of get it uh, Big Cass, Big Cass was underutilized, and now obviously, as Morrissey has more traction elsewhere, or at least has more of a personality. Now that he's not, you know, covered by the mic of Enzo Amore, and then Omos. Omos is not a good wrestler. Uh, anybody who thinks he is, I just, just you're not paying attention enough. Uh, Omos is a giant lopsided like he has he just has no timing and no skill and every match that he's been put in that is a big time match that that has a, a you know some traction to it has been carried by the other person brock carried him at mania and putting him with seth i think was another shot at them being like seth has enough traction to get him through this match and make him look like a star and if he does that we can utilize him more and more down the line um, the match was fine, and uh, in in wrestling terms, uh, I hear this word thrown around a lot, so I'll throw it around right here on the show. Uh, it was mid. The the match was mid. It was fine. I just don't have any. I don't have any positives. It's aside from again Rollins showing that he can rally and and get, keep the crowd into it even in a match like that where I, he even tweeted a couple weeks ago that he had no idea why this match was happening so yeah no no real build up aside from mvp essentially saying that rollins accolades are why the the monster omos has to has to take him down uh, obviously that didn't happen with the uh, weird had to happen curb stomp off the top rope uh, you always got to find ways of putting the beast down, and uh, and Rollins did it. Again, I think the credit should really go to the crowd for being so loud singing Seth Rollins' theme song. The, the rafters had to be rattling. This match had one of those nifty drone flyovers. looked good. Um, nobody's career got better for this match, for having had this match. Seth Rollins does not get better because of this match and omos just like i said once again looks like he cannot carry a full match or at least a match that is of the caliber that seth rollins at least is carrying so that kind of leads you to the who's going to be the next wwe world heavyweight champion conversation which i'm sure will come up a couple times during this show uh omos is not going to be that and if he ends up in the tournament and he ends up advancing in the tournament and stuff like that, it is all coming out of Vince's back pocket on this one. Rollins showed that he can carry it. I think I have three people who I think should possibly be considered for the new world heavyweight title. And Seth Rollins is absolutely one of them. The others I'm sure will come up as we go through this show. Nobody got better 
for this match having happened. It was a filler match, in my opinion. It was a transition in between two matches. Mid at best. Uh, I'm going to give this match two stars. And that's being nice about it, to be honest, guys. Like, I... I don't want to give it a one, and the reason I don't want to give it a one is because Seth carried the match. Seth did a lot of good work, as he always does. One would be an injustice to the accolade and the and the prowess of Seth Rollins. This match gets two stars from me, this pay-per-view, strictly just for Seth Rollins' ability to carry a, a match, especially on a, a premium live event. And then we get into... Match number three, which is for the United States title. It's Austin Theory versus Bobby Lashley versus Bronson Reed. I expected more. All three of the matches that I've listed, like we had a barn burner for the opener, a mid-second match. This match was was decent. It was a fine match. They all just happened so fast. The pay-per-view started at 6, and by 7 o'clock, all three of these matches that I'm in the wheelhouse of right now have ended or have at least been going. It was a very fast first three matches. And I thought that this match probably needed a little more time, Um, but it was solid. Uh, There was definitely a a spot where I Bronson comes off the top rope and lands on Lashley. And it looked like he pancaked his head. Um, Hopefully Bobby's okay. I really didn't hear anything after the event to make us make anybody think differently, but to me it looked like a tight spot. Uh, I'm sure that there's risk obviously in, in, in that move, but uh, hopefully everybody's okay coming out of that. Um, and then you get Austin theory with the heel win with the other two doing all the work. And then, you know, Bobby speared a Bronson theory tossing Bobby out theory with the one, two, three retaining the title. If anybody thought something different would happen again, it's it's you got to watch the product and you got to, you got to see what they're doing with theory. I am not, you can go check TikTok. This, this will verify this. I'm not an Austin theory fan. I don't like Austin theory. Um, I think that he falls into the wicked chosen one curse. Everything that happened with him was so similar to what happened with, with Drew McIntyre for the, the chosen one promo and all that. I'm not a big fan of that process. And both people failed out the gate for those chosen one promos. It took theory a long time to kind of get back to this. Um, before I just didn't like theory because I didn't like theory because I thought it was too much too, too soon. Now I don't like theory because he's a good heel and he's doing exactly what his job is. I really, I hate him because I'm supposed to hate him. And that's what being a heel is all about. So theory has finally, I think hit the great heel phase. He's getting the cheap wins. He's retaining the belt. He's moving on and on and on and on. And I think what, should happen what should happen now that the brand split is official now that the new rosters kick in tomorrow on raw i think we should get la knight versus austin theory for the united states title get some baby face back into la knight keep that heel momentum of austin theory going and i think la knight should be your new united states champion by the end of the month, hopefully Night of Champions. If not, maybe later into the year. SummerSlam is a knock and Money in the Bank's a knock and Hopefully we get a uh, shot at LA being your United States champion. Yeah. All right. That match, though, I'm going to give it three stars. Okay. It wasn't awful. It wasn't great. It was a decent filler match. I think I would have... I would have booked it with Bronson going over again. I think Theory has the heel momentum, which is fine. And Bronson with the call up. Again, he's a bigger guy. So the company's just always like, look at this guy. He's a huge guy. Nobody. He's just a monstrous man. Nobody can beat him. Nobody can pick him up. Nobody. You saw Theory try to hit him with an A-Town down. Yeah, it's not not really a thing for him. I, I think Bronson could have benefited or at least had some momentum onto the main roster, get some validity. But 
at the end of the day, Fury winning is probably the right call. It keeps that heel momentum going forward. And like I said, hopefully sets up for some pretty cool matches down the pipe uh, for for Theory and for that United States title. Bring a little bit of validity back to the United States title. Um, he's carrying it fine. I don't mind what he's doing. The Cena win really didn't... I, th I think John Cena said it best. It didn't do anything. It didn't, didn't make him better. It didn't make him worse. It was the passing of the torch as Cena is now very obviously less than part-time. So, honestly, like I said... Three stars, match was fine. No complaints, really. Uh, could have been much worse. Could have been Rollins, Omos, but it was not. Next match on the card, Rhea Ripley versus Zelina Vega for the SmackDown Women's title. Now, going into this match, I thought, huh, this seems ridiculous because Zelina has had no real legitimate push in her entire career and does not measure up to the current momentum of of Rhea Ripley. Rhea is killing it uh, professionally. She's she's rocking the, the SmackDown Women's title finally. She's essentially, like, you can still say that Finn is the leader of the Judgment Day, but he's not packing any gold. So I think Rhea has stepped up as uh, the, the main stake of the Judgment Day at this point. And outside of wrestling, she is a social media hype master with all of the fanboying, <laughs> drooling men and women just wanting a piece of Rhea Ripley. Um, she's she's amazing. In and out of the ring. She's killing it. So I thought this match had a, had a traction issue. Had the, the process of, of thinking that Zelina could go over would uh, was just troubling to me. I, I didn't think it would happen. I hoped that it would happen. Again, just the betterment of somebody. Rhea is already at that superstar. She already... The belt, you can argue, doesn't actually help make her because she was already getting the killer pops. The crowd was already into her. Social media was already into her before the women's title actually got there. The whole mommy thing will carry for a very long time. Very similarly, I mean, uh, Liv Morgan, when she came back a, a couple years ago, had the weird mommy thing happening with all, all the leather and all that. It's... The crowd knows what they want, and uh, Rhea is what they want. So I don't... Again, the title doesn't make her, in my opinion. I think that the title... Her carrying the title might actually bring validity to the title a little more than it does. Because a lot of odd part-timers and stuff like that... Charlotte's held that belt so many times. And Charlotte, in the last two years, has been part-time at best for being gone, for getting married, and having so many injuries, stuff like that. She's not around as much as she should be. She got drafted. I don't know why. Don't really see her around very often, but... Like I said, I think Rhea makes the belt more than the belt makes Rhea. But with that said, this match was, was again, it was fine. It was not the best match on the card. It wasn't the worst match on the card either. And I think that, the again, Zelina having home field advantage, she was crying before she even the bell even rang. The crowd was super pumped to see her. I, I would argue that you give Zelina her moment, you let her win the belt at home, and then you take it back from her. On, on Raw or SmackDown. I think she's a, she's on SmackDown now with the draft with the LWO. But you, you just take it again. You just take the belt. Uh, arguably, she's not going to ever get the push that she's kind of worked for at this point. And I don't know that you ever get a crowd reaction for her similar to the one that you got. And again, with, with the belt not making Rhea, you could argue that the belt might make Zelina. At least for... I mean, think about how many title reigns and stuff like that we've seen that are just a day or two long, but kind of automatically give a little bit of validity. Finn Balor still gets introduced as the inaugural Universal Champion, and he held the belt for 24 hours because he got injured. He didn't carry the belt. He never defended the title, and he never got it back. He only had one shot at it. So the belt, Finn made, like, the belt made Finn look world champion caliber exceedingly briefly you could argue that a week-long run <laughs> with the women's title for Zelina would at least put her into the echelon of now you have another women's talent who is better for having had this belt and who you could consider for down the road opportunities at the belt just because she's been there she's had it live live Morgan kind of the same way the crowd was so ready 
now she could have more title shots down the road because she's had the belt. She's proved that she can get to the top of that mountain. So I think Zelina wasn't a squash. She had a really good match. Uh, I think that hopefully she gets another shot down the road because she had a lot of traction. Like I said, the crowd was super into it. Um, I'm still going to give this match like a 2.5 stars. Okay. Again, not the best match on the card. I don't think that it was better than the United States title match, but I don't think it was worse than Omos and Rollins. I think this was, you know, two and a half stars. Again, a good filler match. I think it could have been better. I think it could have been way worse. I think what will make people think that I'm giving it too low of a rating is how hot the crowd was. And the crowd was going to be hot for that match, whether it was trash or whether it was a five-star match because Zelina was home and that's all that mattered. She threw a flip-flop at Rhea Ripley. She was in her house. So, yeah, I don't... Whether you think it was a five-star match or not, I think the crowd is what'll make people think that that match was a cr incredible. It was fine. It was a good filler match and uh, an epic segue to match number five on the night, which was Bad Bunny versus Damian Priest in a street fight. Uh, I TikToked about this match the second that the match ended. Uh, <laughs> this match was match of the year material. Bad Bunny is not a professional wrestler, but he goes out there and he takes the risks and he gives it 110% because he has so much respect for the business and for what they do and he loves the product and damien priest and him are from the same town so they grew up in the same area they have a very big mutual respect for each other outside of the kayfabe wrestling world this match had match of the year candidate written all over it the crowd was hot from start to finish with bad bunny being i mean both of them were hometown boys but they were pumped for bad bunny to be there this match, to me, also showed that you cannot count out Damian Priest. Damian Priest was the wrestler that carried this match. Very similar to WrestleMania last year when Sami Zayn carried Johnny Knoxville. Johnny Knoxville is not a wrestler. Bad Bunny is not a wrestler. They don't have the timing. They don't have the cadence. They don't have all of these wrestling words. They don't do it full time, and they don't understand the full grasp of the product. With that said... Sammy called the match against Knoxville. Priest obviously was calling this match and keeping the tempo and keeping the pace. Do not count out Damian Priest. He's up there in age when it comes to a lot of the main roster guys, but I think a shot at a world title should happen in his future. Whether or not he's in the Judgment Day at the time or not, I think he could have that belt briefly, if not for a very long period of time at least to kind of end out his run because again he's not the youngest guy on the roster by any means but i think he can throw down and this match proves he can throw down he made bad bunny look like a million dollars and bad bunny doesn't need that much help to look like a million dollars um we saw some savio vega savio vega one of the original members of uh, the nation of domination and a, a puerto rican superstar uh, the crowd went crazy for, for Savio and the return of Carlito, which even me and my homie who was watching this show, we popped for Carlito. Carlito was a big part of uh, that ruthless aggression era. Uh, you know, he spits in the face of people who don't want to be cool, and uh, he spit in the face of Dominic tonight or on that during that show. So love it. Absolutely love it. Um I hope that they get Carlito back briefly. I know he's done a rumble appearance before and stuff like that. It never turns out to be a even a part-time run. He normally just does a match or two and then kind of goes away. But uh, the crowd reaction shows that... And, and the social media reaction. If you guys have checked out social media today, um, the, the fan base, the WWE Universe, is pumped for Carlito. And hopefully we get some more Carlito down the road. This match should have gone on last sink that in the crowd 
absolutely on fire. The return of Carlito, keeping that crowd boosted him side by side with Rey Mysterio. Savio Vega preventing the Judgment Day from escaping up the ramp, hitting some of his signature moves. The crowd alone is the reason that this match should have gone on last because they drained so much energy just being into this match that the next two matches on the card the crowd was there but not what they were because they drained all of their energy into bad bunny versus priest with the judgment day with the lwo with carlito with savio vega and just with priest versus bunny being an overall fine match like it was awesome it was a great match with or without all the outside interference, it would have been match of the night, bar none. All of the outside stuff, the bringing back Carlito, the LWO, the Judgment Day, those every element together makes this a match of the year candidate. And if it's not on the list at the end of the year, then Dave Meltzer has no idea about wrestling, which I think a lot of fans have started to settle in on by his power rankings. This is a match of the year candidate. If we're giving out slammies, it gets the slammy. This is a match of the year candidate. This match will be the match that I am going to give five stars in this show. I was absolutely hyped from start to finish. The crowd was hyped from start to finish, and the match was incredible. Hats off to Bad Bunny for, for going through the table, for, for taking the bumps that most people work years to kind of uh, build their body up to. He did it. He's fearless. And he fits into the brand. And while I know that he will never be a full-time guy because he is a mega star in his own right, he's amazing. And Damian Priest should not be written out. He could be a future world champion. Period. And that's the bottom line. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm not stone cold. Um, we transition from that, that barn burner. To what you, you you know I think fans are still deep in it, but the bloodline comes out next to go against Sammy Kevin Owens and Riddle, and it's fine, right? Like it's it's it wasn't a bad match by any stretch. Uh, I again I feel like I I was just so drained and the crowd was so drained from the awesomeness of the match prior that I think. I think you could argue that the momentum of this bloodline storyline is starting to fade, which is kind of why you're seeing the build for them to break the blood, the bloodline. It's coming. It's going to happen. I thought it was going to happen last night. If it didn't happen last night, I think you see it at a uh, night of champions. It'll be at another big event, but um, you know, has, has the momentum died for the bloodline? I think you could argue. Yes. I think the crowd knows at this point what's coming. I felt that they broke Sammy out of the bloodline too fast, right? He worked a long time to convince Roman that he was bloodline material. They put him through the trials and the tribulations and they give him the honorary Oos shirt and he, you know, he's a part of the group and very quickly they kick him out because he's the outsider. He's not actually blood and he proves it by not attacking Kevin Owens at the Royal Rumble. I thought they should have drawn it out a little bit longer, just a little bit. Whereas now they want to draw out how long it's going to take for Solo to give the Samoan spike to Jey Uso. It borderline should have had, he should have impulse got him last night and at least built that promo as this is going to be a thing. This is going to be a thing for this program. It's going to happen eventually where he means it. It's not an accident, but it's coming. The, the clock is ticking on the bloodline. Uh, I can't wait to see Roman on, on Friday talk about what, what the hell any of that was. But the match was fine. Uh, I was surprised that the bloodline won. Not necessarily surprised at how they won with, with Solo constantly tagging himself in and constantly having to be the enforcer, the guy who's going to get it done right. Because Jimmy and Jay were pandering to the crowd the entire match. And... It looked to me like Sammy was gonna was gonna pull it off with a bunch of haluva kicks. It uh, obviously did not go that way. Like I said, I think obviously this is probably the last time, right? Because Sammy and Kevin and Riddle are on Raw, and the Bloodline went to SmackDown. So I think we could finally say that the Bloodline and Sammy Zayn thing is behind us. Yeah, 
or at least I hope. Because, again, this is what they do with the Bloodline. This is why people get so tired of the Bloodline, is they get into these programs for such long periods of time. And that's not counting the fact that Roman is borderline a 1,000 days as, as world champion. Grasp it. He's going to make it to a 1,000 days. That is what they're trying to do. He's going to make it to a 1,000 days. It's going to happen. WrestleMania proved it. If Cody couldn't finish the story, which everybody wanted, Roman is going to make a thousand days as champion. Nothing we can do about that. That's what it is. They, he is the one. It's not just a t-shirt. He is the one. He's going to do it. He worked a long time to get through the fans and to be a fan favorite. He got to the mountain. He still went back heel and the crowd still can't decide whether or not he's the best baby face or the best heel ever he's gonna make a thousand days they're gonna make sure that roman leaves his mark on the company forever he will be a part of history when it comes to that world title it is a guarantee again the acknowledge me thing is just you say it's a t-shirt but the the history books of pro wrestling will acknowledge roman reigns as one of the best world champions of all time he has not been pinned since pre-covid (laughs) <laughs> it's been forever he will go into the books as one of the best to do this and it took a long time for us to get from roman is a superhero to roman is the tribal chief so i think this fits and i think eventually obviously the crowd and me and everybody wants this to end with roman and the rock I don't think Roman can hold the titles for that match because Rock can't beat him for the titles because Rock is only going to be there for a month to build the program, to sell the t-shirts, and get the millions and millions to tune in and buy merch and and hopefully sell tickets to the pay-per-view that he's going to be on, which I think will be next year at WrestleMania, which almost means Roman will hold the belt until a minimum of the Royal Rumble. Which I think is real life. I think that's absolutely what's going to happen. Uh, Bloodline versus Sammy, KO, and Riddle. Three stars. You gave it three stars. It was fine. Again, I don't. I, I didn't hate it. It was just, again, so much went into the match before it. So much energy. So much momentum. And then it slowed back down with this match. This deep story that we've been working with for a year. This building story that you just you have to know how it ends and honestly the end is on the horizon you guys again you should be able to see the the fracture in the bloodline is is it's bleeding out guys it's the bloodline is bleeding out so we're gonna have to see how that goes in uh, in future events but three stars the match was fine no real complaints like i said I, if any if i have a real complaint it's that it shouldn't have come after bunny priest Bunny Priest uh, should have been the main event, should have been the last match on the card. Which, now we get there. Now we are to the last match on the card. The American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes, and Brock Lesnar. A match that made no sense out the gate. And still doesn't. Okay? No reason for Brock to turn on Cody. There's really no traction there. I don't know what the WWE's constant thing with having to make Brock a heel is when the crowd is so into him. Like, dude's dressing like Cowboy Undertaker at this point. The crowd loves it. He's got the Viking hair. He's got the beard. He's got the comedy now, which he didn't always carry. Stop having to make him heel. It didn't need to happen. Um, and, and at the expense of Cody, and I think a lot of that was just to deter the crowd from being so upset that Cody didn't finish the story at Mania. Um, this match was not going to be a five-star match. Ever. Ever. The build-up says this was not going to be a five-star match. And this Brock, this match started at 8.52 my time, Mountain Time. 8.52 p.m. These pay-per-views generally last until about 9. Sometimes they have a 10-minute overlay. So 9, 10. Okay? So at most, they had 18 minutes for this match, and it didn't fill 18. It didn't. Because Brock's matches are exceedingly fast-paced. He's in and out. He wants his payday, and he's out the door. The crowd acknowledges, I think, how great he is, but he doesn't want to be out there all the time and for long matches his matches are all the same they're all structured the same it's a million suplexes it's a 
handful of finishers, and they go home. The match was lazy, in my opinion, because it fit that exact template that Brock has had over and over and over again. Cody comes out first. He's chilling in the ring. The crowd gets a little bit hot again because, you know, you got to do the whoa thing for Cody in the in the entrance. The crowd gets hyped for the American Nightmare. Brock comes out. He's pacing the ring like a lion, you know, on the outside doing his circling thing, and he stops at the announce tables because Cody is going to fly out of the rope in a suicide dive and hot start this match because it's the only way. This is how the smaller guys beat Brock or try to beat Brock is you have to hot start the match you have to catch him off guard so Cody beats him down outside the ring gets him with the stairs gets him with the pole just just everything he is throwing the kitchen sink at Brock to keep him down what happens though Brock of course regains control and we go right back to suplex city and we get I think at one point they were up to seven or eight suplexes because they had to start counting on commentary like normal that's how many suplexes he gets is the the commentators have to count them like (laughs) Kurt Angle and and guys like that used to do a lot of suplexes Taz wasn't getting a countdown on how many suplexes he was using and arguably one of the better guys to ever do a suplex (laughs) excuse me Kurt Angle wasn't getting a counter on on belly to back suplexes it wasn't happening and he did a million of them um sorry you can probably hear my kid in the background (laughs) um but like that's just that's the template man that's brock does a million suplexes and then he's gonna hit him with a finish and and now we came to a point where i was like watch the low blow because that's what generally happens right brock gets all this momentum he's standing over the guy and then a low blow happens and it switches the dynamic back to to you know the the smaller opponent it wasn't a low blow cody kicked him in the face or whatever and then they got him into the corner where the the pad had been taken away and he caught the buckle right to the forehead and brock bled like a stuffed hog man more blood than i've seen in a long time cody was covered in brock blood in beast blood all over him uh lots of blood on that so if you uh if you're not a blood person i'd skip that one but uh definitely a lot of blood in that match uh but then like there it is though the momentum switches Brock got another F5 in after the blood came, but like by then it was Cody taking those taped hands and just drilling him in the forehead over and over and over again, and Cody hit at least four crossroads. So that's pretty generally how the Brock matches go. And then Brock gets him in the Kimura, and you're like, oh man, Beast is about to have him tap. The Beast is going to tap Cody. Nope. Not a thing, because Cody does, hands down, the worst tiptoe roll-up I've ever seen in my life, and pins him off the Kimura, and then, before the crowd can even truly celebrate, Cody is gone. Just up the ramp, he does a couple little, like, I won the mat, and then he's through the curtain. Brock is in the ring, just stunned, and I saw a little bit of post-coverage that, you know, the crowd is super loud for him. They always show appreciation to Brock, and we don't know how much longer Brock is going to do this. I think a lot of the guys that we we really like from uh, the Ruthless Aggression era are are on the way out. Edge has said he has a year at best left. <clears throat> Brock, I think, is in the same boat where he'll do some big ones, and then he's gonna gonna be gone. Um, the match was fine, but I'm gonna give it two stars, and the reason I'm gonna give it two stars is. It should not have been the main event. It should have gone when Bunny and Priest went. And Bunny and Priest should have went when Brock and Cody went. Bunny and Priest was the match of the night. Two stars. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. If 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 you guys disagree, please tell me why in the comments. I, I really want to hear some input on this. Uh... But I just don't think that the match carried the amplitude that uh, that a main event should in Puerto Rico when you could have had an all Puerto Rican based match finish out the show and send the crowd packing happy with all of that energy and all of that momentum. Because by the time the crowd got to Brock Roman, 
it was already they were drained the crowd was tired because they spent all of that pop on bunny and priest just my opinion that was the pay-per-view guys that was backlash and now we start running to the end of the month i think it's may 27th or whatever is night of champions um i can't wait to see what they do for who who's gonna get these uh these opportunities these titles and you get the the world heavyweight championship tournament starts tomorrow on raw uh with a, a triple threat match and smackdown's gonna have a similar one and the winners of these matches are gonna I think there's two triple threat matches both nights, and the winner of those go to the main event of those shows and wrestle each other. And then the winners of the two tournament-style matches, essentially, go to Night of Champions. And uh, in my opinion, Seth Rollins deserves a shot at this title. He is the brand at this point. He gets the warrior pop Every time the crowd is into him, he's the most over guy in the company. I know a lot of wrestlers hate the term over, but he is over. He sells a ton of merch, and the crowd will sing his theme song the entire show, whether he's in the ring or not. Rollins should be on the table for the world title. Cody Rhodes should obviously be on the table. He could finish the story that way, but I don't think that he will be, and if he does advance that far, I don't know that he wins the world title. If he does, though, it was just their scapegoat way of him not having to take it off of Roman. To me, that's kind of cheap, right? Because he was supposed to climb the mountain and beat the big dog, but but now he's not doing that. He's going to have to do it this way. That's the thing about being on Raw, right? My third guy is Finn Balor. Finn Balor deserves a shot at that title next week, period. Finn Balor is the inaugural Universal Champion who had to relinquish the belt due to injury and then only got one other shot at the belt, and it was versus Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. And Brock was going to massacre him. It was a squash match. There was no way that even Demon Finn was going to do it. Not going to happen. Finn deserves another shot at this. It would bring back some validity that he's world championship caliber. It would bring validity to the Judgment Day being led by a world champion. If he sticks it out with them at that point and doesn't just go back to being the prince or whatever he wants to do next. I think you could get away with, in theory, doing Seth Rollins versus Finn Balor for the World Heavyweight title at Night of Champions and doing the match again like they did at SummerSlam a handful of years ago when Finn beat Seth Rollins to be the Universal Champion. And I would be fine with either of those guys winning that belt. That match would be a barn burner. I would be completely fine with either of those guys winning the belt. I think they would both bring some validity to that title. I'm sure there are plenty of other people who could win that belt or who deserve to win that belt. If you guys can think of people who you think should win that belt, drop it in the comments. I want to see who you guys think should, uh, should win that belt. <clears throat> I'm interested. Like I said, this is all just based on my opinion. If you guys have an opinion, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to talk about it. And maybe down the road, we can do some lives and we can talk about it together. Um, I am working currently on finding a platform. I know YouTube does lives, but I want to see if I can find ways to, to patch other people into these lives. Um, so chances are I'm going to try to do a live event for uh, Night of Champions, or I'm working on it. I'm not going to sign any checks on it, but I'm working on finding a platform, Twitch, YouTube. I don't have enough subscribers on TikTok yet for a live, but um, I'll find a platform I will update you guys kind of as we get closer on what the Night of Champions event for Introverse Uncharted will look like, whether it's a live event or just another one of these nifty little recap videos. Um, until then, I hope you guys enjoyed the pay-per-view. It, it was pretty good. Uh, I think it could have been way worse. I think it was an odd builder, but uh, <clears throat> Night of Champions, I think, is going to be where the cash or you know the checks are cashed at the end of the month. Um so again, hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys for taking time out of your Sunday, out of your weekend, to tune in to this uh, recap event for, for WWE Backlash 2023. As always, later in the week, there will be an Introverse Uncharted episode on Wednesday. I always do them on Wednesdays. And then Friday will be the debut of Foodie Friday. Um, I was going to obviously do it last week. I put some stuff on TikTok and I, I posted about it. But I went to uh, the Godsmack show in Denver and then lost my voice before I could <laughs> before I could uh, record for the Foodie Friday Cinco de Mayo episode. So we're just going to do one this upcoming Friday. It's going to be a blast. I uh, hope you guys all tune into those. Until then, remember, please 
like, follow, share, subscribe, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, go to all the other social medias and, and follow over there. Send this stream as a text message to any of your wrestling fans. Share it on their social medias. Send it to them as a text. Send it to them as an email. Send it to them as an Instagram. Do do all of that. Every, everything you possibly can uh, to get this out there, out through the, the radio waves. Um, if, again, if you haven't, subscribe to the channel, guys. I'm trying to do do weekly episodes and stuff like that. going to keep the content rolling. Hopefully there's some cool stuff that you guys enjoy on the horizon. Um, send uh, send all the introverts and started stuff out into the wave out into the uh, radio waves. Uh, your mailman, your barber, uh, anybody who you think would be interested in listening, send it on out to them. Thank you guys as always for your continued viewership and your continued support. You guys make it possible for me to uh, take this gamble in my life and start trying to to make this brand and, and make this happen. So I truly and deeply appreciate it. <clears throat> And uh, until next time, guys, as always, I bid you to do more than just exist. Come with me into the uncharted. Thanks, guys.